this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. Welcome on into Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sadas. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here by Ed Fang of the PowerRank.com. Ed, we are on to our third show. Evan Silva coming up later today to talk NFL win totals. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. You know, it's always awesome to talk to Evan. Uh, he knows so much about the NFL. I'm really excited about this show. Yeah, absolutely. And Evan, uh, among the smartest minds when it comes to personnel, and personnel is a big key in betting win totals for NFL. So we'll talk to Evan in just one second. But first, because we're a new show, we got to, you know, give that gentle nudge towards leaving us ratings and reviews. If you like what you hear from Evan coming up later, or if you like to hear from Whale Capper back on Monday, or JJ Zacharyson last week, please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts slash iTunes. I think it's still kind of called iTunes. I don't know honestly know because i have a, a google pixel phone but regardless <laughs> and we got our first review for the show last week yeah actually i just looked i think we have eight but i okay. definitely want, um yeah i just looked i definitely want to send a shout out and thank you to bethany um she emailed me she's how much a fan she is of you jim and, and jj zacharyson and and she's been following my stuff as well just big thank you to her for just supporting us uh, and she left us a review, so thank you. And if if you guys enjoy what you're hearing, the reviews really help us get exposed to other people. Mm -hmm. It kind of works with the Apple Podcast algorithms, um, mm -hmm. so we pop up in other people's feeds that might be listening to other football podcasts. So anything you can do in that way would be awesome. And Bethany also asked the smartest questions on Twitter, and I always appreciate those as well. Uh, make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, it is up there. Just so you make sure you get a podcast whenever we post one, because next week, a bit of a different schedule because I am going on vacation to the most desirable of vacation locales, South Dakota, Aberdeen, South Dakota, uh, where everyone wants to go for their summer vacation. I'll be there next week, so a bit of a different schedule, but if you subscribe to Covering the Spread, you'll get the podcast right as it is posted. Uh, back on Monday, we talked NBA Championship Futures with Whale Capper. Make sure you check that out. We went through how good of a value a team has to be in order to justify tying a bankroll for almost a full year and betting NBA Futures. We also discussed all the changes for the Warriors, Lakers, Clippers, Rockets, and their outlook for this year, but also teams that Whale Capper thinks might be undervalued right now. Looking forward to having Whale Capper back on soon because he was a lot of fun to talk to. Of course, JJ talked NFL player props last week. You can find all those on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. Again, coming up in just one second, we're going to bring on Evan Silva of EstablishTheRun.com. His new site just started with Adam Levitan, another Super, super smart guy in the football sphere. You can follow Evan on Twitter, at Evan Silva. No underscores there. We're going to talk NFL win totals, where the value lies for 2019 in just one second. But first, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and present, physically present, in New Jersey or now Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Evan Silva, coming up next. Covering the present. Let's bring Evan Silva into covering the spread. Evan, you are in the middle of launching a brand new site called EstablishTheRun.com. We're got we've got training camps ramping up, preseason DFS just around the corner. Are you sleeping or are you just like running off of fumes by this point? How how are you operating right now? Well, I'm taking naps. I'm, I'm you know sleeping twelve hours at night. I'm trying to get rested for the season, man. Your preseason DFS right around the corner, August first, man. Like, and that is like 20. That's your prime time to shine. That's the best ROI DFS sport that on the planet right now, I think, unless you're like, you know, some <laughs> WNBA or, you know, tennis right. <laughs> expert, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you like to play DFS and actually win money, because it's really hard to win daily fantasy money yeah. these days, uh, you know, just playing uh, regular season DFS. I mean, it's fun. And you can yeah. win money. I'm not saying don't. You know, definitely do. I do. I play every single week, you know. But um, if you actually want to win money, uh, your chances at making like a significant ROI are, are are much higher playing preseason DFS than playing regular season DFS. 
I know preseason DFS is part of the, the whole package here at EstablishTheRun.com. So, Evan, tell me about Establish the Run, what you're offering during the season, and kind of the game plan for the site as you gear up for your first year. Yeah, so Adam Levitan and I started this new website. We hired as writers Pat Thorman, long time of Pro Football Focus, Josh Hermsmeyer um, of 538, maybe the best pure data analyst going right now uh, in media outs- uh, b- behind you guys. Um, and then we're trying to turn it into kind of a one-stop shop just for all football coverage because, you know, I, I try to cover the league year round. You know, it's not just a fantasy thing. I cover free agency. I cover the draft. You know, I've had some pretty good success predicting the NFL draft for the past few years. I love to watch and study college prospects and, and podcast and write about them. And, you know, even after this season, my hope is that we'll be covering the XFL from a daily fantasy perspective. All right. Um, yeah, because I, I've heard, you know, word on the street is that XFL already kind of has lined stuff up with FanDuel and DraftKings. Um, and I don't want to say that for sure, but I, I, I've right. heard, yeah, I don't want to say that for sure, but I've heard rumors of that whispers, um, you know, little birdies talking. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'll, I'll say that, I'm very hopeful that uh, XFL will become, will kind of catch on as a, a daily fantasy sport. Um, and so, and you know, as I mentioned, I'm so excited for our preseason DFS package. It's going to be, it's going to be top notch. Uh, and we're going to crush it. And you can find my top 150 rankings, my tiers, which are like extremely in depth. Um, and then my weekly matchups column on establishtherun.com, uh, where I break down every game um, and talk about every fantasy relevant player and going to try to, can incorporate more and more sports betting information as I myself learn more about how to become a better sports better. Um, I'm not like, I'm, gonna, like, I'm not going to be, get, you know, we're not, I'm not selling picks, you know, but right. as I myself learn how to uh, become a better sports better, uh, then I will try to incorporate information that can help people uh, in that respect. Excellent, Evan. Yeah, and I remember when I first uh, started reading your matchup reports, just impressed with the depth in every game and how long you spend in that. I uh, want to thank you for coming on the show because we wanted to ask you about some win totals and, and particularly just your process for how to find values in NFL win totals. Um, are you looking at like fragility based on injuries or regression from the previous year? What What, what is it in your process? Yeah, so on EstablishTheRun.com, I have 30 of the 32 teams – uh, written up uh, both from a fantasy perspective and then at the end I talk about win totals and kind of you know where I'm leaning on, on each win total um, and the win totals kind of move around a little bit they get bet up they get bet down a little bit um, but uh, yeah I mean there are a bunch of different metrics that I like to look at when evaluating the win totals and most of them deal with regression as you mentioned uh, I start I start with a team's previous season, uh, win loss record in one score games, which tend to regress mm-hmm. toward the mean for better or worse. Yep. Uh, Football Outsiders puts out some great metrics in terms of injury rates, and those also tend to regress toward the mean the following year. And I think that schedule strength has actually become kind of underrated as a metric because um, uh, people kind of like look down upon it. People think that things change so much year to year. I think that that's wrong, especially early in the season. Um, we don't give ourselves enough credit for being able to predict how good or bad offenses and defenses will be. Look, you know, over the course of the season, guys are going to get hurt. We're going to learn more about teams. But early in the season, we typically have a pretty decent handle on how good offenses and defenses are going to be after you study the coaching and the personnel changes, you know, realize how good or bad the team was in the previous season. Um, And so I think that in the first six weeks of the season – our first like four to six weeks of the season, um, we can have a we can kind of have a little bit of an edge just by doing more work and outworking our competition. And a lot of that work does start now because we're going to learn things as training camps open. We'll see injuries, you know, find out which guys may not be healthy. When you're looking at win totals right now, Evan, are there any storylines that stand out to you that could be impactful when it comes to betting win totals for 2019? Any big stories you're watching right now? Yeah, and I'd say that it begins with the Ravens because I'm really looking hard at the over on the Ravens at eight and a half, um, which seems to be kind of contrarian because the consensus out there is that Lamar Jackson can't throw. Because look, like the last year, last year the guy threw a lot of ducks, and 
you know, we have like a highlight bias where big plays stand out in our minds. You know, those are things that we remember and bad plays stand out in our minds. Like Mark Sanchez will forever be re- remembered <laughs> for the butt bump, you know. Um, right. And Lamar Jackson had a lot of bad tape, a lot of bad throws last year, but he also didn't even get first team reps until week 10. He averaged 7.1 yards per pass attempt as a rookie, which was better than Andrew Luck as a rookie, far better than Joe Flacco as a rookie, better than Sam Darnold, way better than Jared Goff, way better than Derek Carr. So I think that that highlight bias you know, the, really, it's a low light bias, really. It might, might be the best way to put it for Lamar Jackson. Um, influences the way that a lot of people evaluate him. Um, and uh, actually, Ed and I talked about this on his podcast. Um, but I think that, you know, especially with a remade pass catcher core, especially with, you know, uh, an offensive line that is returning all five starters um, and, you know, the, the most established guys there are a second year tight end and Mark Andrews and the slot guy, Willie Sneed. I hope that they play Lamar Jackson a lot in the preseason. Um, That's going to be, you know, they played, first of all, they played him a ton in the preseason last year, but of course he was like, you know, a backup at the time. And typically teams don't play their starting quarterbacks very much in the preseason, but I think Lamar Jackson needs those reps in the preseason. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets them, um, you know, kind of, and, and then the hold, the holdout stuff, which is yeah. mainly running back oriented. And we know that running backs just don't move the needle. So I wouldn't factor that kind of stuff into my win loss outlook for any team. Like I'm, I'm, but I'm obviously tracking the Zeke Elliott and Melvin Gordon situations for fantasy. Absolutely. Um, so we know the preseason could hold a lot of value for fantasy, but does anything on the field influence you when it comes to, to, to betting win totals? I mean, and actually this kind of maybe leads right into Lamar Jackson and how you're going to be watching him in those preseason games. Yeah, aside from a situation like the Ravens where there is essentially, you know, a first-year starter at quarterback, an entirely new supporting cast, I'd say no. Uh, preseason mm-hmm. is a good time to learn about players that don't play as much in the regular season, learn about the deepest parts of depth charts, see where guys are stacked up on the depth chart. You know, you'll see a guy like – one week he'll be with like the threes and the fours in preseason. And then he has a big game and they give him a shot with the twos the next week. And that, you know, that kind of stuff will stand out, not just from a preseason DFS perspective, but also for just like building our own depth charts and understanding, Hey, you know, if, uh, you know, whatever running back goes down, who might be next in line to get work. Um, So I think it's not a good time to have takeaways about, how good or bad a team is going to be in the regular season, but it definitely can be very helpful uh, in fantasy football. So let's talk about a couple of specific teams here, Evan, and dig into their win totals for 2019, starting off with a team that is near and dear to your heart. Uh, Hugh Jackson's gone. Uh, the, le- the legacy of Sashi, though, does live with the Browns. He's got a job in the NBA now, but the Browns win total but partially thanks to Sashi is now at nine and a half at FanDuel Sportsbook with the under being minus 150. I think the Browns have gotten a lot of buzz this year, Evan, but I think that it's justified given the Odell Beckham edition, given how much talent they have on their defensive line. Have Sportsbooks done enough to account for the offseason changes the Browns have had, or do you think the buzz has made the Browns a bit overrated? Well, from what I've seen, they opened at nine wins flat and they've moved up to nine and a half in most spots but now you are getting some favorable juice on their win total over and i have them projected as a nine to eleven win team and i like over on nine and a half still uh so i like that bet but i i do have two pretty big concerns and i think that any time that you make a bet whether it be you know just playing a guy in daily fantasy whether it be picking a guy in season-long fantasy whether it be you know, betting on a total or betting on a side, uh, you you want to really look at, you want to play the devil's advocate out in your mind. And so what, where, you know, what are some, where are some ways that this could go wrong? Um, our offensive line guru at EstablishTheRun.com, Brandon Thorne, Thorn, uh, he has the Browns offensive line rated six worst in the league. And I agree that it's at very best a bottom 10 unit. And then I'm worried about their depth as a team. You look at, a lot of the upper echelon teams, the true upper echelon teams have kind of proven it. Whereas the Browns have not yet the Eagles, Colts, Patriots, these teams have really impressive depth 
behind their starters. The Browns have a great starting lineup, but the bottom half of their roster isn't as impressive. So I think that John Dorsey, you know, with the treasure trove of assets that Sashi Brown left behind uh, after Sashi Brown, uh, you know, laid in front of the tank and, and, and saved, the, saved the franchise, um, John Dorsey has neglected two cr- critical aspects of team building, and that's offensive line play and roster depth. Uh, and I think that those are two things that could prove to be the Browns' Achilles heel. With that said, I still think they're good enough to get over nine and a half. Um, so that's where I stand with the Browns right now. Yeah, you mentioned the starters on the offensive line, but even like the starters, I mean, Greg Robinson was awesome for the second half of last year under Freddie Kitchens, but the longer track record on him is questionable. So if you've got that question mark at left tackle paired with, you know, the now questions they have on the right side as well, I understand why there is some there's some pretty serious question marks up front for the Browns. I agree that I would probably prefer the, the over there, but I think that the offensive line mark is definitely one to keep in mind there with the Browns. With Greg Robinson specifically, does that does that worry you? And are you trying to keep an eye on him early in the season to see if there is any regression for him from what he did last year? Or do you just want to kind of, you know, let it ride for a larger sample and trust what you saw at the second half of last year? Yeah, absolutely. I think they have two <clears throat> good offensive linemen, two mm-hmm. good offensive linemen. And it's J.C. Treader, the center, who has kind of battled injuries in his career. And it's the left guard, Joel Batonio, who's starting to get up there a little bit in age. And then you have Greg Robinson, who, you know, I've talked to like uh, Brown's like game tape analysts. And, the, you know, they talk about how he was very much helped by the scheme, mm-hmm. helped by having tight end help last year. Um and they're going to need to help him. Uh, they signed Demetrius Harris from the Chiefs, and he's going to essentially act as a six offensive lineman. But when you have to devote another, you know, a, another guy who could be running a route to blocking on the offensive line, essentially, you know, you're putting yourself at a little bit of a dis- disadvantage. Chris Hubbard went from their right tackle went from you know playing under Mike Munchak with the Steelers and really being a, a sit, like a swing offensive lineman in Pittsburgh to being a full-time starter last year at right tackle wasn't very good. And they traded away their best offensive lineman, Kevin Zeitler, and they're trying to replace him with, you know, the potential bust that uh, John Dorsey drafted last year with the 33rd overall pick, Austin Corbett. And, I mean, this guy has not even been able to beat out um, Kyle Kalis, an undrafted guy. So – um, there, there's definitely some, some volatility involved in this offensive line, and they're going to have to work around that. The good news is that they did work around it to some extent last year. They had the same set of tackles in the second half with, uh, you know, after Freddie Kitchens replaced Hugh Jackson as the, and, and, to, and Todd Haley as the offensive mastermind. And also Todd Monken, their offensive coordinator, worked with a kind of subpar offensive line last year in Tampa Bay, and they finished top four in the NFL in yards per play. So, um, they do. I think that they have enough like smarts in the coaching staff to work around this, but it's still a concern. Yeah. So Evan, the, the Chiefs learned that Tyreek Hill will not be suspended. Uh, they've added uh, pass rusher Frank Clark to the defense. They're ten and a half wins. There's plus one fifteen juice uh, on the over. Where do you sit with the Chiefs right now? Yeah, added Tyran Matthew to their defense, although they did lose D. Ford and Justin Houston. And Chris Jones, their stud defensive tackle, looks like he might hold out. Um, and the Chiefs were one of the healthiest teams in the league last year. I think there's a good chance that the Chargers overtake them this year as the best team in the AFC West division. We remember, you know, Phillip Rivers and the Chargers had a comeback win at Arrowhead last season, one of the best games of the year. Yeah. Um, and, and that was in a game where Keenan Allen went out of the game after like 12 snaps. Um, and based on opponent win totals, the Chiefs face the seventh toughest schedule in the league this year. So I think I would generally not just I just wouldn't mess with this bet. Um, and, you know, but I, I but I think if you were, if you know, gun to the head, I'd probably take the under on 10 and a half um, because I think that they're more of a nine to 11 win team than 10 to 12. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of how, and it, it, that's scary as hell though, because Patrick Mahomes is so damn good. Yeah. And I a mean, big part just, of betting is knowing when not to bet too. Right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, th- there are just some win totals where you just want to be like, you know, 
pass. You know, you really want yeah. to pick out like five to six. You know, last yeah. year picked out like five to six and hit on like, you know, four of the six. And that's what, you know, that's where you want to be because you're not going to be able to get everything right, you know, because mm -hmm. this stuff is hard to predict and games are decided by like fumble recovery rate and, right. you know, crazy shit, you know, and, um, but yeah, I think that the best way to do it is just pick out like the, you know, the five or six that you like the most and bet 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 those and the Chiefs would be like bottom five. So one of the buzziest teams right now is the Cardinals. They brought in Cliff Kingsbury. They drafted Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray, the most efficient quarterback in season in the history of college football. The over on their five win total is minus 120. And I think for fantasy, we, we're going to love the Cardinals. I think that Pat Thorman's going to talk about the Cardinals pretty often in his column on Establish the Run. But it's a rookie head coach, a rookie, a rookie quarterback, some shakiness on their offensive line as well. No Patrick Peterson for the first six games. When you look at the win total here for the Cardinals, do you see any value on either side of that line? So here's the thing. I think that the only bet here pretty much is the over. You know, it's a pretty yeah. rare circumstance where betting the under on five wins is mm -hmm. a plus expected value move in general because the NFL has so much variance because of the damn fumble recovery rate, you know, and... Um, mm -hmm. The one score outcomes go so much into determining final records. So I think it would right. just be a very rare circumstance where betting the under on five wins would be smart. So I think that if you're going to bet them at all, you pretty much have to bet the over. But with that said, you know, this would be like a middle of the pack team uh, in terms of not in terms of how good I think they're going to be, although they might be middle of the pack. But in terms of like if I was going to rank teams to bet based on their win totals, it wouldn't be one that I'm super excited about, but I, I wouldn't be afraid of it. Um, but losing Patrick Peterson for six games, I mean, that really, really hurts here, here from a win total perspective. Absolutely. Evan, the Rams has some big changes on their offensive line, but there's got to be optimism around this team. Year three with Sean McVay, uh, hopefully getting a healthy Cooper cut back. What do you think about them at 10 and a half wins uh, with, uh, with minus 150 on the under? Yeah, you talk about their losses up front. It, it, it's pretty concerning. The replacements to the guys that they lost up front on the interior offensive line, Roger Saffold and John Sullivan, are Joseph Noteboom and Brian Allen. These guys have combined to play 110 career snaps in the NFL. Roger Saffold and John Sullivan, 236 career starts. And you know the difference between Jared Goff's performance when he was kept clean versus when he has been under pressure – is really stark. Last year, he was number four in the NFL in passer rating in clean pockets, but he was number 22 in the NFL out of 30 against pressure. And uh, his 2018 trajectory, I think, is concerning, at least on paper, from December on. Um, Eight-game sample, like all of December in the playoffs, completed just 57.7% of his passes. He averaged six and a half yards per pass attempt. And he had a seven to eight touchdown to interception ratio. And he was under pressure a lot more than usual during that time span. He did not have Cooper Cup, which also, you know, people draw a straight line between that and, and his production. And I get that. But is Cooper Cup going to come back and be, you know, the quick twitch slot receiver coming off a torn ACL that he, you know, has been uh, early in his career? I'm not, I'm not entirely sold on that. So I'm very much in the camp that believes that Jared Goff is a product of the sum of his parts as opposed to a true like field general and orchestrator. And I think that the parts around him are worse this year. Um, and so I, I kind of like the under where you can win, even if they just win 10 games. I also think that every team in the NFC West, or at least the 49ers and Cardinals for sure are going to be better than last mm -hmm. year. I'm not sure about the Seahawks. They, they might actually be worse. Uh, but they still have Russell Wilson as their quarterback. So not the easiest division to play in. Yeah, definitely not. And Joseph Nopum also transitioning to guard and drafted as a tackle. So an extra little obstacle in there for them as well. You mentioned the Ravens as a team you're watching closely here early on. Any other teams stand out to you when you were doing your team previews, Evan, as potentially having inefficient win totals that, you know, are in those top five or six you're looking to bet for 2019? Yeah, so and I know I just talked about how betting the under on low win total teams is dicey and probably minus expected value, but 
even after the Dolphins' win total dropped from five to four and a half, I think I still like the under because, <laughs> wow. first of all, you're getting it with plus juice now after the total dropped. Um, so the plus, you know, you're you're getting good juice on it, and I very much think that this is a zero to four win team. Uh, Brandon Thorne, again, our, our offensive line guru, guru, has the Dolphins with easily the worst offensive line in the league. Like, there's like a gap between them and the Texans on paper. Um, and we already know pretty much that multiple quarterbacks are going to play this year. The pass rush is honestly hilarious. Uh, Charles Harris and then, like, they, they have no one in terms of pass rush. They're not stopping anyone on defense. They faced one of the 10 toughest schedules in the NFL based on opposing win totals. And I think this team is worse than that Browns team that went 0-16 in terms of personnel. In terms of coaching, doesn't get worse than Hugh Jackson and Greg Williams. <laughs> but in terms of personnel, I think that this is – it's a way worse team in terms of personnel than that 0-16 Browns team. All righty. That is Evan Silva of EstablishTheRun.com. Evan, we're going to let you go so you can get some sleep, get one of those naps in, uh, get yourself ready for some preseason DFS. Looking forward to reading all your content up on Establish the Run. We'll hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, fellas. Covering the future. One final thank you once again to Evan Silva of EstablishTheRun.com for joining us. Again, follow him on Twitter at Evan Silva, and all of his work is up on EstablishTheRun.com. Let's move now to Covering the Future, the segment where we take a look ahead and look at our numbers, look at our processes, and try to find some bets that we view as being plus EV as of right now. Ed, we've been talking about your college football rankings and your college football win totals up on the PowerRank.com, trying to find some value there. And we're going to go more in depth on those now next week on Tuesday. But when you look at those numbers right now, is there one that stands out to you that you really want to hammer home right now? Yeah, I mean, the team I really want to talk about is the Nebraska Cornhuskers. So this is a team that doesn't necessarily look great in my preseason rankings. They're 52nd. And there's a really good reason why they don't look particularly good. Um, I have a linear regression model that does these preseason rankings. And they look over a four-year period of team history. Um, oh. And the way I measure how good a team has performed is, is through my team rankings. They essentially take margin of victory in games and, and adjust for strength of schedule. Now, when you look at Nebraska over the last four years, it's not a rosy picture. They were 50th last year in 2018. That was Scott Frost's first year. They were 4-8. and eight. They were definitely a better team than 4-8, and eight, which we'll get into. Um, but the year before that, they were 68th in my rank rankings. 2007, that was good enough to get Mike Riley fired. 49th in 2016, so again, you know, not a great team. Uh, 46th in 2015, and my, you know, my model doesn't take that long. Uh, 2015 too seriously, but but it's in there because teams tend to persist in college football. So Nebraska is going to get preseason top 25 hype, and and I actually think this team does have a lot of upside, and it all kind of starts with the quarterback position. Uh, Adrian Martinez was was really, really good as a true freshman last year in 2018. Uh, led this team, and the offense was pretty good. Um, but the other reason that I think this team has a lot of upside is is the quarterback coaching. So their quarterback coach is named Mario Verduzco. And he's an interesting character. He was Bruce Feldman recently profiled him in The Athletic. And, you know, this is a guy that has, like, motion control uh, textbooks on his bookshelf right next to Bill Walsh and, and Nietzsche. Um, so, so he's a very intellectual guy, but, but what's really interesting is his results. So he was at Nor Northern Illinois for a while. He joined Scott Frost at Oregon and, you know, we're not going to give him credit for coaching Marcus Mariota in his last year in college, <laughs> but then the two of those guys went to central Florida and in their first year, they had a freshman quarterback named Mackenzie Milton and their pass offense was terrible. Uh, they were 118th when I look at adjusted yards per attempt, uh, not good bottom 10 type FBS stuff. The next year, after a year of tutelage under Verduzco, they were second in the nation. And that's when they really made that leap. I think I'm pretty sure that's the year they were 13-0. Uh, National champions, baby. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a jump from bottom 10 to top 2 is, is remarkable. And, you know, I, I noticed that jump back in 2017. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, Scott Frost is great. You know, he got the quarterback. Uh, playing his game and throwing. and But when you really look into it, it's probably the quarterback coaching uh, with Verduzco and, and the things that he's doing and the way he's training these guys. Um, and, and, and above and beyond that, like it's really Adrian Martinez. The kid's clearly talented. If he can take any kind of 
leap beyond what he did last year, I think they're going to be uh, pretty good. And and that's why you're going to see this team in, in top 25 polls this year. They do have some issues on defense, especially the interior of the defensive line. Um, they weren't particularly good last year, and all those guys are back this year. But, you know, it's... My model says 6.6 wins. Markets have it at 8.5 wins. And this is an example of where you don't say, oh, my model has under 8.5 wins. Let's go bet it. I right. actually don't think that's a bet at all. And and I just want to be clear about, you know, where analytics comes in. Like, you, you it, it is a great objective baseline for you to start evaluating these teams. But you really need to know the story behind these teams. And, and I don't really like 8.5 wins. I think Nebraska is going to be a very interesting team uh, and one I'll be watching very closely in 2018. And again, like we discussed with Evan, there's value in knowing when you shouldn't make a bet. And I think that that's potentially one of the cases here. Uh, I know you're in Big Ten country out in Michigan now. Have you ever been to Lincoln for a game? Uh, I have not. I hear it's pretty remarkable. You got to go. So I grew up in Minnesota, and Minnesotans like to claim that they are nice. Like Minnesota nice is a thing. Right. They have nothing on Nebraska people. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I I remember that. Yeah, like I was, I was doing radio uh, with Northwestern, and we got to like fly with the team and stuff. And they had defeated Northwestern on a hail mary. And as we were walking back to the bus with the Northwestern players, all the Nebraska fans were saying, "Oh, you guys play great. We hope we do well the rest of the season." And I was like so confused. I'm like used to like <laughs> Michigan State fans like right. flipping me off across the street. And the, and the Nebraska people are just like, "Hey, hope you have a great rest of the season. Have a nice flight back." And I'm like, "I want to live here." And it's like yeah. I've never had the urge to live in Lincoln, Nebraska, until that exact moment. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've heard that they're even, they even treat Texas fans that way uh, from back Ooh. in their Big Twelve rivalry days. Uh, that's a true test. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, that team, that fan base went through some remarkable turmoil last year yeah. in terms of an 0-6 start. And what was interesting about that 0-6 start was that, you know, they had better yards per play in five out of those six games. I mean, they got they got stomped by Michigan, uh, a game I was at here at the big house. But besides that game, they actually played pretty well. And when yeah. you get better yards per play than an opposing team, you win about 80% of the time. So a lot of bad luck in that stretch. Obviously, we're better four and six down uh, the last games, and and uh, I, you know I, I I you know what I talked about uh, last time about Texas. How I don't see a lot of optimism there. Kind of believe my model there. Uh, it's just yeah. not the case here with Nebraska. I think it's going to be an interesting. And you mentioned Adrian Martinez. We may be talking about him on Monday, actually, yep. uh, because Edward Egros is going to join us on Monday to talk Heisman betting, uh, some bets he likes, whether he likes betting to a tongue of Iloa uh, and, and the favorites, or if he'd rather go a little bit longer, this bet up on FanDuel Sportsbook about Trevor Lawrence or Tua versus the fields. So we'll talk about yep, that as well. So uh, follow Edward at Egros on Twitter as well. We'll talk to him on Monday. And Ed, you talked about some times where – you want to go counter to the analytics. And I actually, I'm on a similar vein here from my cover in the future segment, because if you go to number five right now and check out the team rankings, they they project the Atlanta Falcons as having 21% odds making the playoffs. And at FanDuel Sportsbook, the Falcons are plus 138 to make the playoffs, which is an implied probability of 42%, which is double what number fire has. But I still think I want to bet the Falcons to make the playoffs because I think those odds are too long for a quarterback who is as efficient as Matt Ryan has been and who is as efficient as I expect Matt Ryan to be this year because he finished sixth last year in net expected points per dropback. He was third in overall expected points added as a passer. And if you look at Ryan's career, that's the fourth time in 11 seasons he has been the top five in total padding, passing net expected points. He is, he's is he been a top five quarterback a lot of times throughout his career, and those guys don't miss the playoffs very often. He has been in the top 10 in net expected points added as a passer five straight seasons, and now he gets a beefed up offensive line. Chris Lindstrom and Caleb McGarry are on the right side of that line. That generally leads to increased offensive uh, efficiency. It's the second year of Calvin Ridley, though he did get... Uh, it looked like he pulled his hammy in practice on Thursday. Fourth year of Austin Hoopers. Keep an eye on Ridley, but this is an offense that's probably going to score a ton of points this year, and it's a defense that's set for pretty major in- injury regression because last year they ranked 25th in adjusted games lost on defense, according to Football Outsiders, and it wasn't just that they lost 
you know, game to day injuries, they were big losses. Keanu Neal, Deion Jones, those are two of the biggest players in their defense. And they both got hurt early on, and Jones came back later on, but Neal did not. And that's a big loss for a defense right at the middle of the field. If their defense can go to being mediocre, with how good I expect this offense to be personally, they can win a lot of games. So yes, the numbers, you know, at number fire don't give them the best odds to make the playoffs, but I think that when you combine injury regression defensively with how efficient I expect Matt Ryan to be with that beefed up offensive line and uh, the receivers that he has, I think it does make sense to bet the Falcons to make the playoffs at 138. The NFC South has an aging Drew Brees there. Uh, The Buccaneers are going to be fun. Not sure they'll be (laughs) good, though. And uh, Cam Newton, some questions around his shoulder, too. So I think the Falcons are actually a pretty good bet to make the playoffs. And even though the numbers don't back it up, I kind of like him at plus 138. Ed, uh, any thoughts for you on the Falcons here for 2019? I mean, I completely agree with you about what I think about the offense, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, and and everything you said. I'm a little bit worried about the defensive side of the ball. Sure. I feel like, you know, last year when I look at success rate adjusted for strength of schedule, they were 29th. Um, The previous years, it was one of those things where they kind of looked okay in my numbers when I was looking at yards per pass attempt adjusted for schedule, but... um, it never really felt like a great defense. And then obviously with some injuries last year and then not a lot of, you know, big acquisitions on that side of the ball in the off season. Right. So that, that's the only thing that concerns me about that team right now. Um, you know, when I, when I look at, I think when I, when I look at win totals and, and back out NFL rankings from them, you know, Falcons are 11th, 12th. So I think that's about right. You know, and okay. And, uh, you know, it really depends on the defensive side of the ball. You know, like how yeah. you know, how great can the offense be? You know, can the defense get to mediocre? I think that's what you got to be. Uh, the balance there is really going to decide their fate this season. And I think that the the point that backs up what you were saying there is that it implies their defense is fragile. And there's a lot of fragility right. there because there's not enough depth. And that's a right. concern for sure. Um, so I think that that is a good counterpoint to make for sure and something to keep in mind here at the Falcons. But plus 138. I'll take that for sure. That is all we have for this week on covering the spread. Anything for you over at the Power Rank this week um, or yeah. anything on your podcast? Yeah, actually, um, I had uh, Gadoon Karolos. Uh, he goes by Spanky on Twitter. He's a professional sports better. Um, and, you know, I've, I've known Spanky and I had him on the show and I learned a ton. I, I, I yeah. was like, I walked away from that. Uh, my mind was really changed. No, I mean, not necessarily changed, but his approach is so different from kind of what you hear a lot in the sports betting world. Um, I think it's worth a listen whether you bet on games or not. I think it was just that interesting. And he's so passionate about what he does. Right. And you don't often get people who do this for uh, just just being so open about his methods. Uh, yeah. You know, when this when it could potentially affect his business. Uh, I thought he was super generous with with his information and and football analytics show uh, most recent episode. Yeah, and you can find that wherever you get podcasts. I was listening on Spotify today, so you can find it there. That's my preferred place for podcasts. So make sure you find that there and follow Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. You can also subscribe, rate, and review covering the spread on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Covering the spread is up there. I am at Jim Sanes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We want to thank everybody for tuning in for today. Two episodes next week, Monday and Tuesday, talking a lot of college football, and I am pumped to dive into that. We'll talk to you all then. This has been Covering the Spread here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.